August 6th, 1945, the first wartime use of a nuclear bomb unleashed incredible power and wiped out the city of Hiroshima in an instant. Survivors say it was hell on earth at ground zero where the bomb hit. Tens of thousands were injured and died later. Those who survived suffered from cancer and other diseases. Three days after Hiroshima, another nuclear bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Many say the bombs brought an end to World War II when the Japanese surrendered. Some argue the bombings were not necessary or justified. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima by the United States is Peter Kuznick. He is professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. Peter, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. When the United States dropped those atomic bombs on Japan, Dwight Eisenhower said Japan was already defeated and dropping the bombs were completely unnecessary. This is not some revisionist historian that we're talking about here, not some radical peacenik. No, this is no. a man who's <clears throat> supreme commander of Allied forces in Europe, a future president of the United States. Was he right? He was right, and he had a lot of company in that position. In fact, six of America's seven five-star admirals and generals who got their fifth star during the war are on record, like Eisenhower, saying that the atomic bombs were either militarily unnecessary or morally reprehensible. And many of them said both, as did Eisenhower, as did Admiral Leahy, who was Truman's personal chief of staff, as did Douglas MacArthur. We're not talking about pacifists. MacArthur actually said that we had, if we had changed the surrender terms to let the Japanese know they could keep the emperor, the Japanese would have surrendered in May. The, the Japanese were already defeated. They were trying to surrender. There was no, use, no excuse militarily to use the bomb. There wasn't, the, the official myth is that the bombs were used in order to prevent an, eva an invasion, that the only way the Americans were going to get the Japanese to surrender was by invading, and we were going to lose hundreds of thousands, up to a million men in an invasion. Nonsense. Mythology. Lies. As Admiral Leahy said, I could see no justification from a national security point of view for an invasion of already thoroughly defeated Japan. All right, and Commander Chester Nimitz, commander of the Pacific Fleet, said the same thing as well. So the question is, why did the U.S. drop these bombs? The U.S. wanted to drop the bombs. It's sad. It's tragic. It's, uh, it's, it's outrageous. But the U.S. wanted to drop the bombs for a couple of reasons. First, Truman probably hoped that it would expedite Japanese surrender. And he wanted to speed up Japanese surrender because we had promised the Soviets that if they came into the war, we begged them to come into the war, they agreed to come into the war, we promised them a lot of territorial and economic concessions if they came into the war. Truman thought that maybe we could preempt that. And if we got them to surrender before the Soviets got in, then the Soviets would not get what we promised them. Secondly, the United States wanted to send a message to the Soviet Union. The United States wanted to let the Soviets know that if they interfere with U.S. plans in Europe or in Asia, this is what they could expect. And the Soviets understood that. In fact, the Soviets interpreted precisely that way, that it might have been physically dropped on the Japanese, but the real target of the bomb was the Soviet Union. In fact, the United States had broken the Japanese codes. We were intercepting their cables. Truman refers to the intercepted July 18th cable as, quote, the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. He knew they were trying to surrender. He knew that, that the Soviet invasion, American intelligence had been reporting since at least April that the Soviet invasion would convince all Japanese of the complete inevitability of defeat, that they would surrender almost immediately, which is what happened. The myth in the United States is that the atomic bomb ended the war. The reality is that the Soviet invasion ended the war. You know where you can go to find that analysis? The official U.S. Navy Museum here in Washington, D.C. says that the uh, atomic bombs had almost no impact on the Japanese military leaders. It was the Soviet invasion that convinced them to end the war. Looking at the long-term impact of those bombings, uh, how did it change the United States, and especially how the United States saw its role in the world after that? Well, what it really changes is all of history. Truman said on at least three occasions prior to the bombing that this was not just a bigger, more powerful weapon. This was a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. They warned Truman not to use it, many of the leading scientists, because they knew it would trigger a nuclear arms race that could end to, the, end to the annihilation of all life on the planet. So what I'm saying is that, and what Oliver Stone and I say in our documentaries, is that killing innocent women and children is a war crime. 
threatening all of humanity with extinction and all life on the planet goes far, far worse. And so our indictment of Truman for that, because Truman was not, that's the interesting thing, Truman was not bloodthirsty. He didn't get pleasure out of killing people. He was not one of the, he was not a Hitler by any means, but a decent human being. And if he could do this, what does that mean for a Barack Obama? What does it mean for Vladimir Putin? What does it mean for any of the other leaders around the world who have these nuclear arsenals? I don't think that any individual should have a veto power over the continued existence of the human species and that's what these people do with our understanding now of what nuclear winter means. Right, and yet circumstances change, relationships change, and when we look at the evolution of the U.S. relationship with Japan, there's been a radical transformation. We had the Japanese Prime Minister addressing Congress 70 years later. I mean, no. how did that happen? Well, initially, we, were, we imposed a very democratic, radical reform on Japan. Article 9 of the Peace Constitution was our idea. Japan would ban the use of warfare and mil offensive military forces in the future. Then we started to get a change of heart. By 1947, 1948, we were saying, well, maybe this is going too far. By the time the, the Korean War started, the United States was trying to get Japan to drop Article 9 from its constitution so that Japan could come into the Korean War on our side. Now we're supporting Abe in remilitarizing Japan. We're supporting Abe in doing away with Article 9. So we've had a complete reversal. Disappointing to me is that Obama is going along with these, these plans. When you had a former prime minister from the Japan De uh, Democratic Party, Hatoyama got elected a few years ago and wanted to reform Japan. It was Obama who crushed him because Hatoyama was supporting the people of Okinawa in, in blocking the base relocation from Futenma to Hinoko. And Obama forced him to renege on that. His government collapsed. And now we're back with these right-wing uh, LDPers like Abe. Right, and that attempt to revise the Japanese constitution is causing a lot of concern, yeah. especially in the region, especially in China. China and Korea, but all of Asia was victimized by the Japanese. Interestingly, the Japanese were initially welcomed as liberators because they were taking over from the Western colonialists, the French, the British, the Dutch, and so they were initially welcomed by those countries as liberators, but the Japanese were so cruel and oppressive in those countries that they were widely hated. And now all of Asia is up in arms. They're concerned about Japan's historical revisionism, that Abe is trying to change the textbooks, that he's been doing this for decades now, since it's in order to minimize Japanese responsibility for what happened, deny the comfort women, deny the aggression, and the uh, re revoking Article 9, as he's trying to do, despite the fact that the Japanese public is still overwhelmingly opposed to that. By a two to one margin or more, they're opposed to what Abe is trying to do. Abe was prime minister once before, 2006 to 2007. He pushed this right-wing nationalist agenda and, and his government collapsed and he was out of office after a year. I think he's overplaying his hand again. I think that this is gonna also backfire and, and hopefully he'll, he'll be removed from office. Right, Peter, there is a common narrative, and it was, I guess, most prevalent during the Cold War, that nuclear weapons act as a deterrent yeah. to war. Yeah. You know, we have this doctrine of mad, mutually yeah. assured destruction. That's why, yeah. you know, countries would not go to war against each other. Is that true? No, it's not true. But it's, it, it's true up to, it works, deterrence works to the point where it doesn't work anymore, and then there's no world left to look back on it and regret what happened. Um, you look at a case like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Both Kennedy and Khrushchev were doing everything they could during that crisis to prevent a war. They had no control. The US uh, destroyers were dropping depth charges on a Soviet submarine. They didn't know that they had, they had nuclear weapons on board. They had lost contact with Moscow. They, they, the electrical system was wiped out. The commander, Savitsky, says, we're doing somersaults down here. The war probably started up there. Arm the nuclear torpedoes. It gave the order to arm the nuclear torpedoes and was about to launch. Would have taken out the American fleet. World War III would have begun on that spot. But another sub-commander, Arkhipov, calmed him down and talked him out of it. Had Arkhipov not done that, they were ready to launch their nuclear torpedoes. Kennedy and Khrushchev drew the lesson from the Cuban Missile Crisis that crises can't be controlled. And so they did everything the last year of Kennedy's life, Kennedy and Khrushchev did everything they could to ro roll down the Cold War, to end the Cold War, end the nuclear arms race, end the space race, 
pull the U.S. troops out of Vietnam to reduce all the conflicts, the possible situations that could cause another war between them. Unfortunately, Kennedy was assassinated and Khrushchev was ousted from power the following year. Right, and when we look at nuclear proliferation, we seem to be going in the other direction right now. There was yeah. a time when there was talk of reducing the number of nuclear warheads around the world, but now it's going in the other direction. We look at the list of countries, more and more countries that are acquiring nuclear weapons or trying to get them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a dangerous situation. Mohammed al Baradei, the head of the IAEA, warned that about 40 countries have the technological capability to develop nuclear weapons, and many of them have a stockpile of fissile materials to do that. It's a dangerous situation. We hoped that Obama was going to provide leadership. He's strongly anti-nuclear in his background. He marched against nuclear weapons in Central Park as a Columbia student in 1982. He made that great speech in Prague, or pretty great speech in Prague, and he calls for nuclear abolition, says the United States has the responsibility to lead that effort because we're the only country to have used nuclear weapons in warfare against another country. Uh, and, and now what's Obama doing? You don't hear him talk about nuclear abolition. Obama is now calling for the, the revitalization of America's nuclear capabilities. He wants to invest about $335 billion over the next decade, and it's been estimated this is probably going to cost a trillion dollars over the next 30 years. Obama is a huge disappointment when it comes to this. The Chinese are modernizing, the Pakistanis, the Indians, India and Pakistan came very close to a nuclear war last decade. Right? The, the assumption everywhere was that they were about to go to war, that the Indians would overwhelm the Pakistani ground forces, the Pakistanis were going to retaliate with nuclear weapons. One of the Pakistani military leaders said, well, you can get killed crossing the street, getting hit by a car, you can get killed in a nuclear war. What's the difference? I think there's a big difference. We now know, with the understanding of nuclear winter, that even a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan of between 100 and 200 nuclear weapons would probably kill 2 billion people and lead to a decade of famine, starvation, and disease. Uh, I mean, this is the, the, what we're, we're talking about. That's 1 or 200. We've got 16,300 still. According to the NPT, the nuclear powers, the five nuclear powers, were supposed to aggressively move to eliminating their nuclear arsenals. They've got the moral chutzpah, you know, authority to, be, to, to rain down on Iran for a program that the CIA says stopped in 2003, and yet we're revitalizing and modernizing our nuclear arsenal. What's the message that we're sending? We think that it's so necessary for us to have nuclear weapons. How about Iran, we, with, in a country surrounded by hostile forces, uh, we can understand why they might want to. I don't want to see them get nuclear weapons. I don't want to see Saudi Arabia and Egypt and other countries follow up and get nuclear weapons. That would create anarchy in the region. But you could understand why Iranian leaders might want to. And so far as Iran's nuclear power, you have to remember that not so long ago, Carter, President Carter was pushing Iran to develop nuclear energy. That saying that they needed nuclear power so they could save their oil for other uses, and the U.S. was offering to build and was supposed to build eight nuclear reactors for them and give them a massive amount of fissile material, the same things that now we're so concerned that Iran might acquire. So this, you know, we have to know some of this history. We don't, unfortunately, as a nation. I'm going to have to leave it there. Peter Kuznick, thanks for joining us. Thanks.